Kia ora koutou katoa and welcome everybody to this community research webinar hosted by me, Janet Miller and Kamri Dunn. Now we're very lucky to have Robin Pope and Laurie Segal Woodward here this morning to tell us all about PCOMs. Firstly, over to you, Kamari, to welcome our speakers. Oh, kira koutou, um, te whānau, ko tau mai, ki tēnei kaupapa. I'm really uh, privileged to be part of this wonderful uh, webinar. Today, the kaupapa is about PCOMs, which is a unique approach to supporting people who need help to thrive. It gives people the power to set their own goals and measure their progress, as well as providing organisations with data to develop and shape effective services. Ladies, we're really, really uh, privileged to have you join us today. Uh, and Fanu that are here, thank you for taking time to be with us. We'll hand it over to you to, um, to introduce PCOMs. Kia ora. Kia ora toto. Today, Robin and I are here on behalf of Partnering for Outcomes Foundation Aotearoa, or POFA, which was founded in response to the recommendation of a report that we'll outline at the end of the session. BOFA is a charitable company designed to hold PCOMs intellectual property within New Zealand and to uphold the fidelity and integrity of the system through training, support, and through data collection. But first, let me tell you a little bit about PCOMs. PCOM stands for Partnering for Outcomes Management System. It's co-designed to address the lack of engagement of clients, to privilege their voices, and to provide evidence of efficacy to clients and to funders. It can be used with many populations by a wide variety of practitioners. So Robin and I will use a variety of terms to refer both to the service user and to the practitioner. So please replace our terms with the ones that best fit your service. In a nutshell, PCOMS has many components that make up a sum much bigger than its individual parts. First, it's an approach. PCOMS is a systematic, person-centered way of engaging with people that we're trying to help, and it focuses on the how as opposed to the what. PCOMS is also a philosophy. It's not value-free. It's based on the principle that the people we work with are experts in their own lives, just as we are in ours. Although it acknowledges that professionals have specific skills um, and expertise, PCOMS requires that we hand over power to the consumer to give them space to construct their own solutions. PCOMS is also a measurement tool. It has two separate forms given at the start and finish of each intervention to measure outcome and engagement. It's also a consumer feedback mechanism. Because the measures are scored and discussed in the session, real-time consumer feedback can be incorporated into the work and shape the rest of the time spent together. Survey and feedback forms can be problematic because consumers generally don't stick around long enough to complete one if things aren't working for them. These are frequently the ones who most need the help, but programs can only be shaped based on the feedback that we managed to obtain. PCOMS is also a quality improvement system. All the attributes and nuances of PCOMS combine to create a comprehensive proven system that measures, evaluates, and shapes practice while demonstrating efficacy. So it solves the issue of practitioner variability by highlighting tangible development areas when gaps emerge. PCOMS also provides clear aggregated data to suggest which program or intervention works best with which populations by which practitioners. It even allows for real transparency and supervision or case reviews because the data brings attention to the consumers who have to be reviewed. Finally, PCOMs can track overall service efficacy. Within the health and social services sector, prioritizing funding to programs and organizations that work is important given the large number of them and financial limitations of the government and NGO sector. However, measuring what works is complex. And here are only some of the reasons why. First, comparing the efficacy between health and social services requires a common measurement across the sectors so that we can compare apples with apples. Second, it's essential that the measurement targets whether people are better off as a result of the service or the program being offered. However, this is difficult when services can target very different things. Third, 
The measures must be culturally appropriate to ensure that success is determined not just by what the funders pay for, but according to the people participating in it. Finally, the measures must be easy to understand, quick to administer, relevant to the service and engaging. Otherwise, they won't be used. Or if they are, they'll merely become an annoyance or what we call a form flicking exercise. Our presentation is going to explain how PCOMS overcomes this complexity. We'll then cover some of the difficulties inherent in a solution that's so simple, and we'll conclude with relevant excerpts of the report commissioned to reflect how PCOMS has been experienced within New Zealand organizations. These excerpts are from service managers, practitioners, and service users. First up, Robin and I will talk about how PCOMS addressed our need to account for our efficacy, get reliable consumer feedback, and provide a quality improvement program. She and I met as fellow clinical managers responsible for the quality of our services and the development of our clinical staff. So these were the things that appealed to us. So starting with a, um, this is a summary of why we've adopted it and I'll expand on each point shortly. So number one, it provides quantitative proof of client improvement and service efficacy. Number two, it is an accredited evidence-based practice, uh, which then goes on to provide practice-based evidence. Four, it improves outcomes. Five, it is atheoretical and therefore additive to any therapeutic orientation, including other evidence-based practices. Um, and finally, PCOMS is a proven quality improvement strategy. So following on, um, Reason number one, provides quantitative proof of client improvement and service efficacy. So it measures clinically significant, reliable change. It identifies improvement based on the service provided. It organizes data into a tangible, usable format, and it enables easy reporting to funders. The second reason, evidence-based practice, um, it was granted evidence-based practice status through the Substance Abuse and Mental Health Services Administration in America. So that's also known as SAMHSA. Now this is a big deal to get past the gates of US insurance funding. It also has um, the research supports and validates PCOMs across cultures and languages. Robin will talk about the research in the next few slides, uh, including a recent study conducted in China, where it was found to be very effective. Uh, it reduces client dropout by addressing lack of fit or lack of progress early on. It forces practitioners to focus on the things that lead to positive change. And it directs practitioners to take the clients to supervision who are most likely to deteriorate without a change in the practitioner style. So Robin now will talk about the research that supports PCOMS and eventually led to its accreditation. Thanks, Laurie. Some of the, when, when Wesley, I work for Wesley Community Action, uh, which is a social service provider in Wellington for the wider area. And for us, it was, using an approach that we felt worked, which was a strength-based approach, we were pretty sure that the whole message and the connection and the relationship was really important when we worked with people, but we weren't quite sure why. And so when we met Dr. Barry Duncan, who co-designed PCOMS with Dr. Scott Miller in America, it suddenly made sense. So the first one that I want to talk about is Project Match, which is a um, study done in America on the, the biggest study ever done on drinking treatment. And what they found is what they used is they divided the groups into CBT, 12-step and motivational interviewing. And we know the 12 step is the AA. We know CBT. Um, I often refer to that as kind of a Kanye West therapy because it's so cool and so considered hot and no one's ever quite sure why. And motivational interview all of which are really important models. It's, as I said, the largest study ever conducted, and what it found was there was no difference in outcome between approaches. The biggest difference that came through 
was the client's rating of the Therapeutic Alliance. And that was the best predictor of treatment participation in the program, drinking behavior during treatment and drinking at 12 month follow up. So what they found was it wasn't the model, but it was the relationship and the connection and the client's view of whether this was going to be valuable that was the most important. This study has been replicated. If you want to go on um, Barry Duncan's website, Better Outcomes Now, there are a number of studies that show that through a depression study, alcohol, a whole lot of areas have shown that what is the key predictor of a good outcome? It's, some, it's the connection and the belief. So the next study that we looked at was a meta-analysis by Dr. Michael Lambert in America, and he did a study of studies of studies to look at if we're looking at good outcomes, what are the key things that we can find? And what, if you look at this, what you find is he divided it into a pie graph. So if you look at a single successful outcome, 40% is that client extra therapeutic. That comes from clients making changes. So if I'm doing work and in the middle of the night I can't sleep and I look out the window and I see the moon and it, I see a cat and I look at the cat and I think, you know, Nana had a cat and Nana always believed in me. And then I start thinking about why Nana believed in me or whoever it is, what were those moments? And those can be really pivotal in decisions to change behaviors or take really courageous steps. <clears throat> and that accounts for 40% of the outcome. 15% is model and technique. And that, while it seems small, is significant. We don't go in to changing relationships or working with people and just sit there and go, off you go. We need to bring something and we need to be very confident in the skills that we bring. What we've tended to do is oversell that 15%. So much of our energy and time goes into what we do, what models we use, what programs we have. And then we tend to report on people that have attended those programs. So what PECON's attempts to do is change that focus and look at those other areas. 15% is placebo or hope. And that's about turning up to an organization and thinking, I want things to be different and I'm really engaged. That's a really important component. And the final component is what Lambert has called the common factors relationships, okay? And I'm going to expand on that now when we look at this three-legged stool. What are those common factors? It's also called the therapeutic alliance. And the first is goals, meaning, or purpose. What are we doing and why are we doing it? The second is means or methods what kind of thing, and we'll refer back to these three when we look at the two scales of PCOMs. But that second is, what do you think might make a difference? How are we going to do it? And the third is the client's view of the therapeutic relationship. That's not scoring us as practitioners, it's the fit or the temperature in the room. We all know that we've worked better with some people. This allows us this feedback in real time straight away. So what is this alliance? What we know from a whole lot of studies and that the client's rating of the alliance is the best predictor of engagement and outcome and has seven times the impact over model or technique and accounts for most of the variance. So what PCONS does is hopes to shift that focus to look equally at the alliance and how that's going as much as we look at the what we do, which is the model and the technique in the program. So it kind of shifts that power back and it gives us real time feedback so that we know by week two, if the alliance isn't strong or the model isn't the right one, we have that opportunity to change things in real time rather than waiting for those feedback sessions at the end of an eight week program. So just to recap on that, the meta-analysis from Lambert did another one and they divided the group into two. So they looked at those in the feedback group had 3.5 higher odds of experience change and half the odds of feeling worse or 
what people, we start calling them, you know, they're not engaged. Actually, it's just not working for them. So um, the, for those who are interested in the evidence base, the next two slides talks about the seven randomized clinical trials that have been completed by the Better Outcomes Now team. And they have been trials used in Europe, China, and United Kingdom. There was a cohort study done in the UK with children in schools, but had exactly the same outcome. And whilst these RCTs have primarily been done in psychology sessions or in therapeutic counselling sessions, there's also been a recent one that has been completed in group therapy with returning Vietnam, uh, sorry, Iraq and Afghanistan veterans who had quite significant drug and alcohol issues as returning. And again, it was the same outcome each time. Adding PCOMs increases engagement and increases outcomes. So at Wesley, we thought, well, wouldn't this make sense as an add-on? It's not a replacement. You don't stop what you're doing in doing PCOMs. It just checks that in each and every engagement, we are focusing on what we know as the best predictors. So the summary for that is that study after study shows there's no difference in outcome between models and theories. All of them work with some of the people, some of the time. And as I said, it's incredibly important that we hold on to our theories and models. But what we need to apply equal focus to is that alliance and the client's own perception perceptions and their ability to be more significant part of that relationship and change process. Putting the focus into how we do it as well as what we do. And as I said, all of those randomized clinical trials had allowed have allowed us to be really clear about this. We knew this made sense. Most of us as practitioners along the way know that. We know when we are engaging, but what we need to do is focus within each and every one. Thanks, Robin. Uh, carrying on now with the third reason why, PCOMS provides practice-based evidence. Each service using PCOMs can easily collate their own data or evidence on what works. Services can use collated data and evidence to demonstrate efficacy for specific practices, interventions, programs, and the entire service. Practices, interventions, and programs can be shaped then based on firm data. And frontline staff can use the evidence to improve their own approach as they practice. Managers can use the data to determine professional development needs and supervisors uh, can base support on the evidence of client need versus the staff members report. The fourth reason is that uh, PCOMS improves outcomes and Robin outlined that nicely. It ensures a consistent focus on the predictors of good outcomes, namely the alliance, which increases engagement. Ongoing feedback allows the worker to adapt and improve to meet the specific needs of the person in front of them. Soliciting feedback puts clients at the center of their own care. Um, and PCOMS individualizes the treatment process. So in, incorporating clients paradigm ensures cultural appropriateness. Uh, because imposing our version of wellness on another person can be perceived as directive or top down. Um, and that, of course, puts in a system where um, that gives potential for further colonization. Finally, dropout reduces when clients are engaged. And because you're measuring it, PCOMS allows you to recapture your at risk non responding clients. The fifth reason, um, the fact that it's a theoretical, PCOMS checks that what you are doing is helping. PCOMS can be used to cite any modality. Um, PCOMS has been used within a wide variety of programs, uh, from inpatient psychiatric to GPs to budgeting advice, um, and it doesn't in any way dictate the content. Uh, it, really only requires a willingness to let the client lead. And the sixth reason, 
comprehensive proven quality improvement system. PCOMS provides consumer feedback for all clients in real time, which removes reliance on anonymized surveys or trying to get um, surveys back. It accurately evaluates efficacy of each intervention and of the service. It provides an early warning system to prevent dropouts, uh, to prevent deterioration and negative outcomes. And it streamlines caseload management, uh, review and supervision. It makes it clear when goals are reached in order to negotiate a safe and respectful exit from the service. Um, it highlights areas for professional development and it manages practitioner variance within any organization. So who? Um, who is it appropriate for? It's appropriate for any consumer who's seeking or requiring a change. It's normed or validated to measure distress. Um, but I should point out that mandated clients and voluntary ones um, are able to use it both very effectively. And randomized clinical trials have shown no difference between mandated and voluntary clients, even though mandated clients sometimes come in uh, not appearing stressed or um, not identifying having a problem or even a need to change. There are three versions. It's normed um, to work with people age 12 and over. Uh, it's also translated into 20, over 20 languages and literacy is not essential. So it's picture based and it can visually be done uh, without having to read the words. So what type of organizations can use it? Uh, so first of all, sector type. Uh, it suits sectors and services that offer helping or change interventions, um, that provide services within an inpatient or an outpatient setting. Uh, inpatient examples might be prisons, hospitals, residential services. Um, outpatient examples include counseling centers, medical practices, social services, um, and it suits uh, sectors or services that wish to provide proof of efficacy or proof of results um, and sectors that want systematic feedback from service users. Um, it also suits sectors and services um, who have a specific philosophy. So um, it really supports services that legitimately see service users as the experts in their own lives. Uh, that are prepared to implement the philosophy throughout the entire organization at every level and are committed to using feedback to improve services and not as a punitive performance measure for frontline staff. Um, and finally, uh, who will invest in supportive software and supervision that aligns with PCOMS. Um, okay. Yes, yeah. yeah, so now we've kind of covered the overall of PCOMS. What is it? It's two forms. One given at the beginning of the session, which calls an outcome rating scale, which looks at four domains. And I'll bring that slide up next. The second is the session rating scale, which is given at the end, and that covers the client's view of the therapeutic relationship. Thinking of that pie graph again, the outcome rating scale covers those other areas, which is that extra therapeutic and goals and means and methods. That's then graphed, so you get a number out of 40. And what we, the other key predictor, as we know, change doesn't often happen if it's not noticed, and small changes lead to bigger changes. So each time that graph, I, if it's going up, then you can have conversations like things are going well. If it's flatlining, you want to have that conversation sooner or if it's decreasing. So it just allows those conversations to occur in, for, in real time. One of the issues is that a lot of the original kind of testing that they did was a minimum of 45 questions. Now, no practitioner or a client is likely to fill in 45 questions each time we meet. So this simply is four scales that are unnumbered and we ask the client to place a mark, there's the outcome rating scale, on each of those areas in relation to why they're working with us. So individually, how are they feeling within themselves about the issue? 
interpersonally and, and you will discuss this individually with your client, whether it's family or close relationships, how are they seeing themselves within that setting socially and then overall. Each line is 10 centimetres, a mark is placed and then it's added up. Then the rest of the session continues and you will, practitioners will use their skills to unpack each area. So why is this low? What's happening here? And it's actually the client's story that comes out, not ours, as clients unpack and discuss each area. You would then agree on goals or how, you know, whatever theories or models you use. And then you end the session with the session rating scale, which is the final leg of that three-legged stool. And that is checking the fit. Do people feel respected, listened to, heard and understood? And was that fit right? So that session rating scale just checks in. So if we look at the outcome rating scale there, first off, we are getting the client's view of the issue. And as that's unpacked, and then we would be looking at a theory of change. So you would be asking which area would you, you know, if it moved up a bit, would you think would help the issue? What do you think needs to happen for that? So you're just getting the client engaged in the solution as soon as possible. And as you get onto your means and methods, you will use your own way of working with, you know, have your own model or technique. And it, as I said, uh, at the next slide is a session rating scale. That's given at the end and that's checking the fit. Now, one of a family I worked with many years ago had, I had decided they weren't engaging and I was going around and we kept talking and it, finally I said, what's the problem? And they said to me, you talk too loud. So for them, they were seeing me coming in and yelling at them, but I just have a very loud voice. So that enabled me two choices, either to drop my voice and start working again, or to acknowledge that maybe I'm not the right person. That's where you pick this up. The good news is seldom do you get a lot of scores under 36 out of 40, but this is that ongoing check-in. So the next one, once you have that, is it produces a graph. And these are real graphs from us, but this becomes a discussion because you are able to ask clients why things are moving up and what they've done differently. And that's attributing their work to that process. So if in the middle of the night I looked out and saw the cat and thought of Nana, and that score went from 12 to 20 as a result of that, it stands to reason we want to talk about that bit. What was it that made you think about that? What are other things we can do? What did Nana bring? Any of those areas, that change, as soon as clients attribute what they've done differently, as opposed to thinking what the service has done differently, that's the stuff that actually changes clients' perception of their own ability to manage change. So, When do you use it? You will decide that. We've used it in our group work. We use it in our individual work. We've had amazing opportunities where we've gone away with um, both a number of gangs to work with them about their theory of change. We used it then. So at any time when you're engaging, you need to agree, should we do it weekly or fortnightly? But what you're doing is what, what you want to measure is what we're doing, is it working? You need to talk to the graph so you can see change or address it when it's not happening. You need to make sure you do the outcome rating scale at the beginning of the session because that should set the scene for the discussion you want to have for your client. And then you need to be able to discuss those scores and anchor them. The SRS is given at the end of the session and the graphs come to supervision. So Laurie's now going to talk about some of the learnings that we've got from this process. I mentioned earlier that something so simple has some trade-offs. Um, adoption isn't necessarily easy. First of all, the practitioner and the service user have to relate the scores to the reason for service. 
If the measures aren't clearly anchored, the scores merely become a barometer of what happened that day. Um, the measures also have to be administered regularly and consistently. Change is more likely to occur in the earlier period, and this is where we're most likely to prevent dropouts. So failing to measure early on can be catastrophic. The conversations around the marks are the gems, not the forms. This is where the practitioner expertise comes in um, to elicit the client's meaning from the numbers. Using PCOM supports service users to identify their theory of change. However, truly making space for the client's view and solution is the key to being culturally responsive. If we're too directive and go straight into problem solving, even if we think we see a clear solution, we end up disempowering the service user and imposing our own culture. So uh, another list of simple but not easy. Uh, it can be used with families uh, to bring another perspective into the conversation. But this requires familiarity and practice with the measures uh, to, prof to proficiently juggle and incorporate other viewpoints. Uh, also, the marks have to be measured, added up, and discussed in the session. If the forms are only set aside once completed, they fail to form the basis of the client's understanding of change. Um, and the resulting numbers become virtually meaningless. This is what we refer to as form flicking, which is a common mistake made by practitioners who aren't necessarily on board with the approach. Also, the data has to be graphed and used to inform each subsequent session. The graph forms the visual for the client to see their progress and make sense of whether they need to change their strategy. So it's reinforcing for them. Supervision also needs to incorporate the graphs. The beauty of PCOM supervision is that the client gets prioritized in supervision based on their need. In other words, if their score is declining or not increasing quickly enough, uh, it means that the client's well-being dictates how much time they get in supervision, not the practitioner's opinion of their well-being. Looking at uh, implementation from our learning, these are the shifts that need to occur. Due to the intricacies that I just outlined, it's fair to say that train and hope doesn't work. Implementation requires a firm understanding of key aspects of the system by all staff. It requires a culture shift that has to take place, not just in the frontline staff, the people who are using the measures, but all the way up to the board level. Form flicking by frontline staff all the way up to half-hearted investment by management can undermine the implementation before it even starts. Stage one, exploration and decision-making. This is where we ask ourselves, are all staff members capable of making the necessary changes? Can we commit to its ongoing use? Is management able to invest in systems and supervision that aligns with PCOMs? If these answers are yes, then we move on to preparation. This is important and includes training and support systems. Stage three, using PCOMs, involves supervision and supporting staff to use it. Stage four, keeping on keeping on, means using and incorporating the data. And from our learnings, these are the shifts that need to occur to any culture implementing PCOMs. So for frontline health professionals, the client is the expert. This is going to be challenging for staff who feel they've rightfully gained a qualification or training that sets them apart from their client. Privilege and power are not easy to give away. Strength-based client-led solution-focused work. Um, it's easy to get into a pattern of not having faith in the consumer's viewpoint when it's evident that the consumer has made some pretty poor life decisions in the past. Um, burnout high caseloads and objectionable client behavior can contribute to a feeling of disdain or frustration with our clients, which can then lead to us focusing on client deficits and problems and imposing our solutions. Um, it requires a commitment to the practice framework. Change is uncomfortable. Um, and PCOMS requires a lot of different changes, but all of the elements of the system are essential to make it work. 
Staff have to be well informed and brought on board to ensure that the big picture of the system is kept in mind. The culture of feedback, as mentioned, um, feedback can be confrontational for a variety of reasons. Creating an overall climate at work where constructive feedback is solicited and shared between colleagues and between staff and management creates a parallel process. If managers aren't expected to consider staff feedback, how can we ask staff to consider client feedback? So with regard to management, a required culture shift in management, um, feedback cannot be used punitively. And I'm, I, I cannot say this strongly enough. Uh, Dr. Barry Duncan has threatened to de-license anyone who is um, known to be doing this. Um, if we're asking for staff to give away their power to their client, it stands to reason that we need to reward them for obtaining honest feedback. Therefore, negative feedback is a sign that the staff member has done as we've asked. All honest feedback means there's a trust in the relationship. So it's critical that management doesn't base performance on the feedback, but rather on what they do with the feedback. The culture shift for board is just an overarching commitment to resourcing um, and staying on board. For supervision, uh, it changes how reviews work and it may require a change of supervisors from a smaller pool. Um, and will certainly change the nature of how clients are brought up for discussion. Data. The proof's in the numbers, but what do they mean? What does client success look like? Because the measures are normed, we can identify whether a client has gained significant reliable change. However, depending on the service, you may choose to gauge success on whether the client has finished a program within a specified time, for example. The organization first needs to determine what success looks like by collecting results from their own database over time to set an initial standard. The next step is determining what agency effectiveness looks like. This will differ depending on where the organization is in the implementation process. Um, in the first year, for example, an organization may choose to measure success as the percentage of clients with whom staff members use measures in every session. Once implemented, the agency may aim to measure the number of clients who have shown clinically significant reliable improvement, or maybe the percentage of premature dropout. Looking at key performance indicators, these can be set to reflect this expectation without being punitive. Uh, once benchmarked, the organization can set standards based on their accrued data. For example, any score out of expected range must be documented in the notes with the description of the actions taken. And actions taken may also be prescribed in job descriptions and staff training. Um, finally, monthly reports. Once the organization has decided on the items to be benchmarked, software should be um, easily able to calculate monthly reports outlining how effective the service is. I just thought I'd spend a little time talking about Wesley's implementation. Um, we had an awful lot of learnings about that, but what we knew at the start was we measured the level of engagement. And this is from a service where clients are given the opportunity to be sentenced, literally, in a court or to work with us. So they're not knocking at the door going, look, I think I've got a problem. But it was a pilot service called Watch where they looked at so many young people coming in with drug and alcohol issues. Should we not address those rather than the um, criminal activities that resulted? So what we knew prior to PCOMS, it's 61% of Toyota engaged in the service for more than one session, which actually meant 39% of people kind of started and then disappeared. When we implemented PCOMS, that number increased to 95%. So we had the same worker doing the same job, added this engagement process in, and it was quite a significant increase. The next one we talked about was the overall ones here. As I said, prior to PCOMS, we had um, had the co 19 Toyota had their cases closed and 25% of them reached clinical change. 
once we introduced PCOMs, that went up to 60%. Also, our dropouts reduced from 39% to 9%, and the number of people who achieved all their goals had doubled. So that's really significant opportunities and outcomes for clients by adding something that didn't change the service. We have implemented it, and believe me, we have done it really well, and, and I have done it really badly in terms of implementation, because it's not just a matter of train and hope, as Laurie said. It's much, much more. The cultural shifts were really significant. How do we address concerns as they arrive with staff? Staff said, look, I don't like bringing forms. It doesn't work for my clients. This isn't working for these group. Every one of our staff and every one of our services at points kind of said, look, it's not going to work for my client. Um, and what we talk about is actually engagement and outcome and having a say in what the issue is and having a say in what the solution could be works. We need to align that and we need some PCOMs champions. You need to find the people that do it, do it well and can share that information. One of our services just, and it was uh, working with people for financial literacy and wealth creation in a community led service we have in Cannons Creek. They have embraced it and just don't go anywhere without it. Some of the rubs we've had, things like Family Start or our contracted service, where the contracts are so prescriptive, it's harder to fit that in. So we sit down and we need to work on that. So all in all, it's about the client and the outcome, not about the service. It's not just a data collection exercise. We're wasting time if that. It's not a performance measurement tool. As Laurie has said, if we start challenging staff on client scores, they will fake scores or they won't do it. We need to have the client's truth and story in the room. What we know, PCOMs work when it's used well. And the other flip is PCOMs is evidence-based and practice-based. And that works really hard and supportive for many of our staff. So for us, the key shifts, and Laurie's covered them with Wesley, many, many clients stop giving suggestions and ask more questions. So rather than thinking prior to that, oh, I know what can help, it's actually just sitting and listening. The client becomes a hero of the story not us. We check why we're in clients' lives and can be much more focused. When supervision comes in, we have their truth in the room because I can look at a graph when I'm supervising clients and talk to them. And I actually get a story of that client's life inside that supervision room. And, uh, you know, for me, one of those proverbs, until lions have their own historians, tale of hunting will always glorify the hunter. And we've shifted significantly with tales of hunting are actually glorifying the lion. So um, the last section that we're going to talk about briefly is a report that we commissioned to look at where PCOMS was being used in New Zealand. We got funding from MSD. We had interviews to go across New Zealand to gain some insights into what worked and what didn't work. So what we found is PCOMS can be transformational for clients. And I won't go into detail because we've got clients' gra um, comments in there. But when it's implement, when to, implemented well, one of the clients said, I remember seeing the graph going along and along, and then it spiked, and I knew my life was settling. I have talked to clients who have a graph beside their bed to remind them just of the change they've made. It can also be transformational when it's not used well. The system and clients don't engage with it. One of the, as I said, clients said, if you just say, can you fill out the form before we start the session and then leave it to one side, it's of no value. And then staff say, oh, clients don't want to engage. I had a <coughs> staff member who had heaps of them. I said, how are you introducing it? And he said, oh, this is a form my boss wants you to fill in. So it's up to us, to, but this has to become the client's form, has to be their story. And that requires a whole lot of skill and courage on our part to ensure that happens. And for staff, 
practitioners who felt well supported and confident were able to use PCOMs effectively and to see results. The other part, which is the next slide, which is a quote from staff, was that my favourite aspect, it gives you and your client the ability to pinpoint and discuss a problem. They've given you the heads up in a non-verbal way. And we, when we talked in our youth services, girls like that, they externalised it. Boys really like following the change. So it's different for different people. But some things work for some people, but they did never tell us what works for who. If it's not working, we tend to pathologize the person or double the dosage, see them twice as often. Unless you use PCOMs, it's just trial and error. And for organizations, oh, sorry, the other one is people talking about, I never knew I had the answers, I just knew I had problems. They talk about helping themselves and seeing their own story grow. And for organisations, it was, um, as Laurie said, if you follow that process and do it slowly and understand it, then PCOMs can be absolutely transformational for them. PCOMs needs to be closely aligned with the organisational structure so people can check with the values the culture of PCOMs has to come from the chief executive. Our chief executive, David Hanna, stood up and made a statement, this is the way we're going to work. It's something, it's not something we do, it's who we are. And the data is our client base talking to us en masse. So data is seen as an opportunity and a threat. Confident practitioners used feedback to adapt the way they worked with individual clients, as well as reflecting on their practice. The biggest change to my work is the reporting. Now I'm seeing the narratives and I can talk to the figures, says one practitioner. Um, and a manager says, with PCOMs, I can see how clients progress in relation to the reason for service without having to see too much detail. Organizationally, data generated helped identify patterns and manage staff development and productivity. In some teams, it led to moving from sporadic, unfocused work with a large number of clients to intensive goal setting work with fewer clients. Um, data is seen as an opportunity um, and a threat. Finally, um, in one of our programs, the no-shows reduced from 59% to 19% as a result of PCOMs. One of the biggest hang-ups with PCOMs is the HR implications of the session rating scale, says another manager. And supervisors are key. PCOMs needs to be integrated into supervision structures. If the supervisors weren't on board, PCOMs was more likely to be poorly implemented and superficially used. A manager said, supervision used to be all one way, the worker bringing the story, but with the graphs, you're bringing the client into the room. A practitioner said, I need a supervisor who sold on the idea of PCOMs. That would help tremendously. Another manager said, you've got to coach, coach, coach staff to express a deep and meaningful interest in what the client scores, um, making meaning of it, valuing it and believing in what they put down matters. But as I said, feedback can be scary. It takes time and skill to create a culture where clients actually feel okay about giving honest feedback. A practitioner said, the session rating scale is great, but it's hard to hear it, but you get over yourself. I adjusted my work, I found I talked too much. Another practitioner said, I remember the first time I used the session rating scale with a young person. At the end of the session, he said, you weren't organized. I've never forgotten that. A client said, your worker, your worker may not have meant to make you feel a certain way, but the fact is that she did and she needs to know that. Finally, another client said, a lot of people don't want to say how they feel. If you have a piece of paper, it means you can say things. The alliance is that connection when you get with someone that you think this is the right person who's going to be able to help me through this. But what builds that, it's not just I like you. So what builds that alliance tends to be whether I've got what you call skin in the game as a client, whether I feel listened to and heard 
whether people have understood what I've had to say, but also whether they've asked for my theory of change and the outcome rating scale does that. What do you think needs to happen for this to change? And that belief that they can do it. So let's try your theory, let's go away, you try that and we'll come back and, and have that conversation. So that alliance is both the whole kind of the skill we bring to it, but the ability to ensure that what we're doing brings a client into the solution as opposed to just the problem. Does that make sense and answer that? Perfect, thank you. Okay, and so the result of all that kind of came up with, with partnering for outcomes and you can look at that www.pcomsnz and the report is on there and you can download it should you want to. So, um, kia ora, Robert, I know that you've got, um, oh, sorry, thank you very much for sharing that awesome video because it gave us a great insight into the experience of the tangata that you're working with, the individual. So it was really great to hear their feedback and how it's impacted the way they engage with you. I'm just going to pass it back across to you, Laurie, because I know you've got some ending words as well. As a result of the report that was commissioned, um, it came up with a number of recommendations. One of them was to increase the number of trainers in New Zealand um, to support organizational readiness and implementation, provide training, provide PCOM supervision, and to start building a data set for New Zealand. So that is essentially what POFA is designed to do in order to contain PCOMs. If you have any questions, please feel free to visit www.pcomsnz. Awesome. Hey, look, thank you so much, uh, ladies, for giving us a real practical insight into the way that feedback can be provided at the beginning of a relationship, how that can strengthen the relationship, uh, how it's really important that organisations can utilise that as a signal for growth and development and investment, um, and also the impact that it has on clients as well. So it was really fantastic, Robin, for us to hear the stories of those that have uh, been at the receiving end of the work that you do. So I uh, just want to mihi to you both for taking time to be with us. Finally, I know that we've gone a little bit over time today, um, about four minutes, but if you want to spend a little bit of time with uh, both uh, Robin and also Laurie, uh, we'd like to just direct you across to our Facebook page, Community Research. Come and check it out over there. Um, the ladies will be logged on. And so if you've got specific questions or you want to ask um, more about the training that's coming up or how you can also start to implement some of this into your own organisation, please head over to our website or head to the, um, uh, sorry, to Facebook page or head to the uh, PCOM website um, or also send us through an email as well. Um, so thank you all very much for your time. Janet, would you like to um, just say our final goodbye and then we'll say kakite to all of our whānau that have come to, to be with us today. Thanks, Kay Marie. Thanks so much, Robin. Thanks, Laurie. Thanks, Lassa and David in the background. And um, we look forward to a awesome webinar in December on Papa Māori evaluation, a different topic again. So we'll be in contact with everyone. Thanks, Kay Marie. Kia ora. Kia ora, everybody.